Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Insane Athletics Podcast. And this is Mr. Hassan Mahmood. How are you doing today, sir? Assalamu alaikum. I'm good. How are you doing, Haris? Thank you for having me on the show, brother. Oh, no problem. No problem. Uh, I just wanted to know what is a transformation specialist, Mr. Hassan Mahmood? Well, a transformation specialist, if you narrow it down to the simplest of terms, is someone who can help you transform not just your physique, but the way you think, the way you approach any situation, the mental aspect, all of these collectively is what I call a true transformation. Over the years, the greatest mistake people have made uh, when it comes to transforming themselves is they have just simply narrowed it down to the weight aspect, you know, what it says on the weight scale, whether the scale's going up, whether the inches are coming down, I believe a transformation is much more than that. There is such a close relevance to transforming oneself, not just with respect to the weight scale or the physique goal that you have. It also comes all the way from up here. So the holistic approach of not just your physique, but your mental aptitude, your perseverance, uh, you know, coming out of a dark place like most of my clients do, Overcoming all of that and managing to reach the physique that you want. All of this is what I call a transformation. And since I help people do that over the past decade, that is where the term transformation specialist comes from. So you're focused on the body and then you focus on mental health, right? You cannot focus on the body if you do not address the mental aspect first. So if you were to put it in a sequential order, the mental aspect comes first and the body comes later. Yeah, that's true. Um, so you've uh, trained the likes of uh, Fawad Khan and Mr. Hamza Ali Abbasi. Um, you know, um, I've seen the trailer and the guy looks massive. Um, so I want to know when Fawad Khan came to you, what were his goals? Uh, you know, I've seen, because I've seen his previous movies, he's a pretty uh, skinny guy. But in that movie, he's pretty jacked and beefed up. So I want to know what were his goals, like right down to the core. Well, his goal was to obviously, you know, do justice to his character, which is Mola, you yeah. know, one of the most iconic uh, cult heroes in Pakistani cinema. That is one role you do not mess with. Yeah. And uh, the fatigues. The physique was, uh, the idea was never to be ripped with a six pack. The idea was to create a character which would do justice to the sort of persona that was about to be displayed. So we were not looking for a 4% body fat. We were looking for a dominating physique, more like Bane in the Dark Knight. Yeah. 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 So, you know, somebody who could, you know, really pull off a character like that. Uh, I think nobody else could have done any more justice to this character than Fawad Khan did. And Hamza Bhai, when it came to Nuri Nath, had to be someone who would look even more menacing than the the main lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Nuri Nath is the arch nemesis of Mola. So yeah. you can imagine he had to look twice as more uh, intimidating in physique. So the idea was to be big, strong, intimidating and buff. It was not the beach physique. Uh, that was being targeted in the first place. So we had a very clear vision of what we wanted to achieve, but time wasn't really on our side. So whatever we had to do in a couple of months took a lot of dedication. A How lot. many months? If I recall correctly, we had around three to four months, maybe three, three at most. Four yeah. months? Three months, three. The fourth oh, month three. was... Uh, practically non-existent because the shooting had started and there were so many delays with our training sessions. But I would give it three months, yeah. Wow. So he went from... So if I was to ask, how much how much weight did he put on? So I can't. That's, that another, that's once again an area where people have so much to understand. See, it's not about the weight scale. Yeah. It's about how much they think that you might weigh. You understand? You with me? Yes, yes. yes so it's yes. never about what you see on the weight scale. See, it's about creating a perfect illusion. It's like pulling off a David Copperfield. Yes, yes. So it's how much did you gain or how much did you lose? It's what you see. 
whenever you see somebody who is in good shape you don't worry about what the weight scale says does does you know does anybody worry about that you don't go up to a, a jacked dude or a athletic looking woman and you ask them listen so what's your weight like no you know you would be interested in other questions like you know how long have you been training what your splits are like um what is your training style the weight is the least of concerns when it comes to training a person i do not recall in all of these years of uh, being a trainer of yeah. having you know ask any of my clients to step on the weight scale after every couple of days i i just don't do that yeah i want to be the other way around i want the client to come up to me and say listen i look good and you know this is the weight uh, it says on the scale so you know i'm happy with it and that weight could be very different from what the client perce- you know perceives in the yeah. first place yeah yeah you know they might come to you wanting to for example reach a target of you know cut down to 60 kilograms and then they come up to you and one fine day they're like listen we look good at 70 the vision we had in mind was yeah. what we achieved at 70 so the weight scale aspect just it goes out of the window it's obsolete nobody you know really you know concerns themselves uh, with the weight scale anymore yeah. it's about how you look so if you were to ask uh how much weight did he put on for the role and if i were to give an accurate answer to that somewhere around 12 to 15 kilos yeah look because more than weight i mean muscle because i'm talking about muscle gaining muscle is very hard to do especially in a small time frame and these men this much weight that you're talking about that's very hard to do unless you do you know take other ways but uh and then losing it is another process right so when i see you right when i had seen uh, fawad khan on it he looked more he looked more muscular right with and uh and a bulkier person inside of a bulkier person meaning he wasn't the stereotypical like you know uh muscular jack dude in a six pack abs and you know he had, to, like, had to look uh, menacing like if you recall bane in the dark night wasn't exactly rip rip he was big yeah. you know he was yeah. menacing dominating that's what we had to achieve and that comes after you go to a particular amount of a caloric surplus yeah. and then there's a specific mode of training you follow in order to bring about that density you're supposed to look big you're not supposed to look watery or bloated or you know fat so it has to be done very carefully because the margin of error we are talking about here is very delicate Yeah. So it had to be done very precautiously and to bring about that character in about a 90 days time frame and uh, Fawad bhai obviously being a type 1 diabetic it was not easy at all. So throughout his training I had to we had this device attached to him uh, which would give us constant readings of his blood sugar. So while I would be training him I would have one eye on his blood sugar reading so you know I could orchestrate the way the workout was supposed to begin the workout is supposed to you know end um giving him sugar where it's absolutely necessary required you know then titrating everything down for the couple of days so we knew what to expect from a particular workout so it was a lot of work in there it was very interesting it was one of the greatest uh, i believe success stories of my career as a yeah. as a specialist in transformation so it it was a memorable journey and when it hits the big screen people are in for a surprise because that is a fawad khan the world has never seen before no he's It's the easy. biggest star we have today right i'm so. saying he looks amazing the the movies to watch out for brother i was there on the sets pakistani cinema has no idea what's coming their way they have done a even remarkable even the trailer the trailer is impeccable right It's amazing It's, It's, yeah great another thing you know uh, you brought up that he's diabetic So for a person that's diabetic um you know in a transformation what supplements did you use and what affects the process like how much of his body is slower or faster in terms of the whole process see a diabetic person and a type 1 diabetic person in particular has to use insulin right because their body is just not producing insulin so insulin is the most powerful hormone in the human body and because you are suffering from a disease that makes you eligible to use it if you perfect down the timing and if you know how to manipulate insulin to your advantage and how to manipulate sugars and carbohydrates to your advantage 
you actually have a good chance of you know getting results in a very efficient manner so we had to undergo a process called the you know this is something i call insulin manipulation so you have to titrate things down to the very last gram your everything that you consume has to be there for a purpose you have to be very careful about your food choices you have to keep a lot of things in mind for example you know what uh, what's the sugar reading this morning you know what's the blood sugar reading before the workout all right how is it going during the workout all right how is it going after the workout how is it performing 3 hours later so everything had to be dealt with it was like playing a game of chess you know you make one move you know your blood sugar would make another then you would give it a counter move so everything as to answer your question about supplements listen i do not believe that you need an enormous amount of supplements anyway because um i'm endorsed by supplement brands you know i'm supposed to promote this stuff but i've never uh, taken pre workouts in 10 years since i've weight started weight training myself um there are certain supplements which i have openly spoken about as uh, to being you know not of much advantage when it comes to your physique goals it's the basics are is remember to create a good physique all that matters is to get the basics right it's not the fancy stuff it's never the fancy stuff yeah, yeah. so i see these trainers nowadays promoting so many different kinds of supplements and you know diet programs and all of that i do not know why people and trainers in particular have complicated something as simple as creating a reasonable physique i just do not get it your job as a teacher as a trainer as a mentor is to simplify things down now everybody who aspires to have a good physique has it in their mind that they need a lot of supplements you know uh, a lot of anabolic steroids and in order to you know reach a particular look trust me you do not you just need discipline and you need a work ethic once yes. you combine both of these you can reach a reasonable good looking physique unless you do not set your goals too high and very unrealistic it's very possible to get a decent physique by staying natural another thing so you, did you also look at his nutrition i looked after everything you know that's why oh. see that is why you use the word personal trainer you cannot be somebody's trainer if you are not aware of what they're consuming throughout the day yeah. so his meals were planned by me and it was uh, obviously executed by his chef who i you know got i spoke to i explained how uh, a particular meal should look like we had a meeting i sat him down i explained the amount of oil to use and you know the the way a particular meal was to be prepared how to measure and weigh the the, the meals you cannot just simply walk into the gym train a client and uh, leave it to that you have to be involved in their rest you have to be involved in their nutrition program that's why they use the word personal in front and before a trainer right that's what a personal trainer is yeah uh when you only had about what 3 months to do this transformation what was your workout split with working with him were you working out twice a day once a day every single day um we initially started off with one session a day because um when the time when we started training together fawad bhai had you know been through a rough patch in his uh, life and he wasn't in exactly the best of shape and it was very ill advisable to have him uh, push to extremes right away so you have to respect the body and give it a certain time to settle down right mm -hmm. to get back in the zone you just don't push the pedal right away so we started off with training once a day and gradually we started doing it into splits like we would uh cover the cardiovascular aspect in the morning um combine it with some core work and uh some train circuit trainings and then in the evening we would stick to the weight training the anaerobic aspect of it so that's when we started splitting it up but i started with the splits after 4 weeks not right away acha so so you do um, so you did one body part a day when you got to the no. whole no 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 see it's it's when you have a time frame that's this short and obviously you have to bring the body fat percentage down 
you do not focus on one muscle a day you focus on multiple big muscle groups a day this is the way you extract and you burn the maximum calories and that is the approach we took so he had these circuits i would design for him which would more or less include the entire body divided into a particular amount of sets and reps divided by a fixed time as to when he has to complete a particular set so there are like 6 to 7 variants we are talking about it wasn't your typical push and pull combination and you know chest with back yeah, or, yeah. Uh, or or you know something like a back with triceps no. that we did not have time as a leverage factor right so we had to make and go for the approach which you know had to affect the the client right away in this case fawad bhai was put through an immense circuit training program we designed for him and uh, and when we talk about circuit training it does not involve merely one or two muscle groups right we are targeting the entire body in a given order in a particular system like we would combine a big muscle group with a smaller muscle group sometimes we would combine two small muscle groups together sometimes we would combine two big muscle groups together so it's all very variable it comes down to a lot of variants like if the blood sugar was you know not in a feasible range you cannot have him perform squats right so you would shift down to a smaller muscle group bring his blood sugar levels back up and then whatever else you want to plan out for the day so it's not something which goes according to the book it does not it does not work with somebody who is diabetic you have to yeah. make improvisations every minute you cannot follow a textbook you cannot follow the rule book you have to take the case on and decide things in a matter of seconds because you know his medical condition does not give you the leverage it does not grant you the 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 time to you know follow a particular plan it has to be done very uh it has to come around with a lot of versatility that is why it has to be one of the most challenging cases ever because you just don't follow a textbook it doesn't uh, go that way so you have to make lots of improvisations because you needed to gain weight did you was his diet very strict in a caloric surplus or did you incorporate a lot of cheat meals and dirty food in his to his diet you cannot incorporate cheat meals if you have a time frame of 12 to 14 weeks or 16 weeks to work with see cheat meals they serve a different purpose they see now everybody it's it's a very important question you brought up about cheat meals because people feel that after 6 days of dieting they're entitled to have a cheat meal no you deserve a cheat meal when you have reached a particular target like if i were to give a cheat meal to one of my clients i would set a precedent i would want them to lose let's say you know 4 pounds in a month or 2 weeks and once they reach that goal that is when i would give them a cheat meal because that is when they would deserve it and to in order to deserve a cheat meal you need to you know accomplish a particular a particular goal it's not something you just do right away you're right you've done 6 days of dieting you've done 6 days of training so here you go have a burger no you have to accomplish a particular goal before you are entitled to have a cheat meal as for fawad bhai listen he's diabetic so you cannot you know give him junk food anyway yeah you, know, you have to give him you we have to we had to make food choices which number 1 helped with the goal at hand and number 2 helped with the recovery so we had to be very smart about the food choices so it included a lot of complex carbohydrate uh, i would split his protein intake some sources i would bring in from plant based sources some from the animal based sources and some from the you know, whey protein which we used post workouts or at times pre workouts so you do not give um a dirty cheat uh, a dirty diet plan or you know allow a lot of leverage when you have uh, a three months time frame to play with okay okay so you know you know that's actually interesting because now in bodybuilding even with the pros and everything uh science says that cheat meals you don't need you don't need a cheat meal like you know arnold used to believe how six days of hardcore dieting and then one day just go whatever you want to eat nowadays right people don't do that and they don't even believe in that thing anymore where you need a cheat meal if you keep your body going in the same diet you don't need a recovery phase for your body i respectfully disagree because it is now you know widely acknowledged that 
clean eating is a concept of the past mm-hmm. it just does not exist anymore if anybody claims that they are doing it i beg to differ because as humans you know as people who are accustomed to you know having a particular liking for a particular amount of food or a particular type of food you need to give them that margin right it yeah. keeps things interesting one step forward two steps back two steps forward one step back so if uh, if see you need to have something to look forward to and there's no harm in that if you have reached a particular goal and you do deserve a cheat meal because i do not know where you uh, came across this information about the modern um, pro bodybuilders you know claiming not to have cheat meals having a cheat meal is actually very important to achieving your goals because you need to give your body a signal every now and then else if you do not have a cheat meal you end up hitting a plateau and the only way to overcome plateaus are to give the body something different to work on so cheat meals will always be essential and uh, i'm here to come across somebody who has claimed otherwise no because i was watching another podcast with a so uh, and he had a doctor on so the doctor was saying that they did results and according to science the body well wow. it this this is depends on many other things though but when he didn't incorporate a cheat meal right the body gained muscle and looked more uh mocked to look more ripped and everything right and then when he they incorporated cheat meals they saw that the fat gain or the conditioning was in on point right so over time they say that if you you don't need to incorporate cheat meals but it, i think it depends on the body i wish the person the difference that once again is that that once again is you know subjective to a lot of factors maybe the client he was working with had a had a stage appearance in a couple of weeks yeah right so yeah. it's it's very really, it's it's very really variable see if i had a client who was supposed to be on stage um in the next couple of weeks or somebody who had a shoot um you know or any project upcoming obviously i would not give them a cheat meal four or five weeks uh before that particular goal has to be accomplished so it's very really variable uh perhaps the doctor was talking about someone who you know he was training in order to you know compete for a show or something So it's yeah. very variable, but then again, as the days goes, as the days go by, research is a constant. It's in a constant state of evolution, and it revolves by the hour. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, you must be familiar with the egg yolk fiasco. Yeah, you know, we grew up, and uh, up till two years ago, it was widely believed that egg yolks are a primary source of uh, increasing your bad cholesterol. and it should not be consumed and you know you know god help those who got rid of all the egg yolks imagine how many egg yolks were wasted in all of these years yeah. so two years ago the scientists at harvard they came up with this new research in which they claim that the egg yolk actually contains good cholesterol the hdl and not the bad cholesterol so for the longest of times all fitness enthusiasts and you know health conscious people would avoid having an egg yolk and now all of a sudden you know one research comes up and everybody is back at it again so it constantly evolves it constantly you know changes by the day you know they you know now everybody consumes egg yolks and they have no problems with it up to you know as long as you can remember even if you i were to ask you i'm sure you must uh, also uh, believe that egg yolks were bad for you that's how we were taught it's what we were told no it's exactly yes yeah so what you know what makes you and i think that in another couple of years or a couple of months there might not be a new research which completely destroys an earlier narrative so once again this is highly variable because one one routine might work for a particular client a diet plan might work for a particular client and uh, the same thing might absolutely fail on another so you have to come up with a different game plan yeah so it is not a one size fits all right uh another one for so- example uh deadlifts um deadlifts as you know are very essential some people swear by it you know yeah. they think it's the most important exercise in the gym and uh, kevin levron never did a deadlift in his entire life see 
He believed it didn't really help. Uh, incline bench press and flat bench press. I mean, a bench press is known to be the king of chest exercises, right? It's what mm-hmm. uh, everybody believes. Lee Haney was an eight-time Mr. Olympia. Eight time. A record which was only equaled by Ronnie Coleman. Arguably the two greatest bodybuilders who ever graced the sport. Yeah. Lee yeah. Haney never did a flat bench. He would he would go for the incline more. He said, you know, flat bench doesn't really, uh, you know, help him build a massive chest. So everybody came up with an approach which was, you know, which worked for them. So that is what we as trainers do. We come up with an approach which works for a particular client because everybody comes with a different genetics, a yeah. different skill set, you know, different injury histories, uh, different dietary preferences, allergy histories, medical conditions. So you need to figure out what works best for a particular individual, right? So I want to shift things here. When, you know, you're, you're a personal trainer, you do everything I see. When working with a client, right, um, someone comes to you and says, you know, I want to take growth hormone, PEDs or steroids, right? As a personal trainer with someone who has so much knowledge into it, how do you, how do you take someone forward with that? I don't. I Not never have. Me. Not at all. Because this, see, this is a risk which frankly many people have no idea about they read it off the internet they see a friend of them juicing up and you know looking a particular way and they want you to do the same with them we never ever let anybody touch any sort of performance enhancers especially my clients i've been training people the last eight years now and i can say it with all my honesty hand on my heart that we never ever endorse any sort of performance enhancers and to answer why is because the risk factor is too high and that is something no reputable trainer would want to get their hands dirty with yeah. but what i do is i ask them for a particular amount of time and i promise them to more or less get them to that goal without the use of these uh, hormones and anabolics. And that seems to work pretty well because deep down inside, they're scared as well. You do not know what to expect out of this. And me, see, we spend a lot of time and we worked, uh, you know, we've been working a lot. Um, We've worked many, many, many years to, you know, build a repute. And the Mm -hmm. last thing we want is a client, you know, messing up on anabolics and, you know, you get to take the blame for Why would anybody do that? I mean, would you do that? Would you, you know, no. do something which would endanger your reputation? I would not, frankly. And see, why would anybody want to use performance enhancers? Number one is because they tried to build a physique and they failed, right? Mm-hmm. And a greater reason would be impatience. So everybody nowadays, they are such you know, in such a hurry to create and you know, build a good physique that they're just not willing to give themselves time. So the first thing I do is I, I make them understand that, see, this is the human body and you have to respect it. You cannot, you cannot push it beyond its time. You cannot extract more than what's genetically possible. So you got to counsel them, Harris. You got to talk to them. You got to make yeah. them understand that, listen, it's, it's very possible to build a good physique without the use of these performance enhancers. I mean, clients ask me all the time, to be very honest with you. Mm-hmm. They're like, listen, you know, we came across these drugs. We read about it on the internet. Uh, there's uh, testosterone, there's decadiroblin, there's trenbolone, uh, there's Anavar, there's Mastron, you know, there's growth hormone, IGF-1, yes. insulin, Dianabol, Turinabol, you know, Anabol. So, you know, just... Just put us up on something, right? You know, we want to get big and ripped and jacked. What they do not understand is that once you go down that road, it's very hard for you to come back. Nobody wants to go from being big and ripped to being weak and skinny again, do they? It plays with your mind, Harris. Yeah. Nobody's ready for that. And once that happens, they'll ignore all the safety protocols and they'll jump onto another cycle and another and another and before you know it, you're hooked and you just cannot let go. And that is something I do not preach as a trainer. It is something that goes against my moral values because, you know, like I said before, when we started the show, it is 
very possible to create a good physique without the use of uh, anabolics. Unless you have to step on stage, unless you have to step on stage, unless you are, you know, you know, you have, you are an actor who has to, you know, uh, appear to, you know, appear in a superhero film, looking like a superhero, four percent body fat, you know, weighing in at a two hundred and forty pounds. That's a different story because everybody knows, you know, it's no secret that the actors you see on TV looking all big and jacked and ripped. Uh, in a couple of months, obviously, you know, there is an extra help involved. You have to be honest about it. But I do not blame them for not talking about it because it is such a widely misinterpreted topic that uh, it's it comes as no surprise as to why people don't want to talk about it. So it's okay. Um, do you train for competition for your clients? I I haven't had anybody who has come to me for a competition preparation in the last two years. The last time I trained somebody for a competition was two years ago. And I am highly against uh, competing uh, in bodybuilding shows anyway. So I've been very vocal about it. Mm -hmm. I, I have uh, you know, always been very vocal and I've always spoken out as to the side effects of going on stage and what potential <laughs> risks the athletes go through to be on that stage, you know, so I always talk them out of it. And I'm known to be a very anti uh, competitive bodybuilding, you know, in that regard. Well, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but, you know, when someone wants to be, I feel like if you have the right coaches, nutritionists, and everything, you can do well. You know, I was watching uh, Ronnie Coleman. Uh, if you ever watch his documentary on the Joe Rogan podcast, he talks about how and his organs are perfectly fine, but his back, his limbs, his tendons, his his back has screws in it, right? Because See, Harris, it, he's lifting so Ronnie, much. Ronnie, you know, all respect to him, he's uh, one of the greatest inspirations for me when I started out. I mean, he's he's my personal favorite. But please. Please, for a moment, not for a moment, believe that everybody who appears on Joe Rogan's podcast speaks the truth. I mean, all of them had, have already negated the other. Dorian Yates uh, on the That's podcast. Exactly true. You know, Very true. He, he claimed that, you know, a particular uh, bodybuilder was lying about the dosages that he was taking. Everybody is going to hide the truth from you. Do you really think? Ronnie Coleman is going to come on the the most viewed podcast uh, in modern times and accept to, you know, something like a prostate enlargement or, you know, something which went wrong with his kidneys. Ronnie Coleman was once hospitalized because he fell into hypoglycemic shock in his hotel room and he had to be taken to the emergency and he actually was very lucky to make it out of there because that's how bad... Uh, uh, it looked. Did he talk about that? No. But somebody else who trained him, you know, they did. And, you know, uh, Sean Gray claimed to be taking uh, 500 milligrams of testosterone, which was later negated by Dorian Gates. And, you know, he was actually very amused by that claim. See, nobody, nobody, Harris, is going to come out in the open and, you know, be, be realistic about what they're taking. Maybe one or two, Rich Piana, rest in peace. Yeah. You know, he was very vocal about it. I met him personally as well at the Fed Expo Dubai. Um, he had nothing to lose because he wasn't an IFBB pro. Yeah. You know, so he could he could speak his heart out and he could speak his mind out. But my, you know, my opinion is do not my my humble suggestion is do not believe what they come up uh, with when they are giving out these interviews because everybody knows they're not going to come clean on this. Nobody can. I mean, for the longest of time, uh, they even did not acknowledge the fact that they were actually taking anything to help them with their physiques. Yeah. Now that they're retired and, you know, they do not have a pro card to use, so they're opening up a bit, but uh, unfortunately, not entirely honest. Well, um, you know, um, I wanted to ask, you know, let's just say, um, do you focus on gut health, the stomach health of a client? 
you know, a lot of times I've seen now that the emphasis by trainers is heavily put on, put on gut health. And it's actually something that's that's should be looked upon very heavily now. And it should be always. See, when you design a diet program, like if you were to come to me to help uh, you reach a particular goal, the first thing we do is to take a very detailed assessment, right? I need to know what Hadassan does throughout his day, how he, how he spends uh, his hours working. What is it that he does for a living? You know, how many hours does he have being active? How many hours does he spend being inactive? So there are lots of variables which I need to take into consideration, right? As for gut health goes, a perfect diet plan, if you follow it correctly, will automatically emphasize on your gut health anyway. So to answer your question, we will always incorporate a source of probiotics into your diet plan in order to make sure that your gut health is in optimum condition. There are various foods which help with your gut health. There are various supplements which aid with your gut health. So gut health is very important. And that's a very fair and a very important point you've just raised up. Yeah. So I want to, uh, you know, uh, see what your training like. Do you believe in uh, overtraining, overtraining your body for maximum results? Of course I do. I mean, if you are not taking in the adequate amount of nutrition, you are not taking the adequate amount of rest, then there is no point lifting heavy weights because all that's going to do is to deteriorate your health. It's not going to be benefiting you. So yes, overtraining does exist. And uh, uh, there's so many people who say, no, it does not. But it's why well, it's common sense, basically, Haris Khan. If you're, not, um, if you're not eating right, if you're not sleeping right, and you're training insanely heavy six days of the week, now you be the judge and you tell me, isn't that overtraining? No, it definitely is. Absolutely. Do you have a certain workout split that you prefer? for yours i would say this question for yourself like what you do right to keep a physique that you have to stay as big as you are do you have a specific workout split that you keep my workout split changes every week so i do not recall the last time i started and ended my week with the same workouts i keep changing it every week um, if I were to start training with chest and back last week on a Monday and tomorrow, like it's Sunday here, so tomorrow, I would be opening up my week with legs and shoulders. So I keep changing my splits and I keep changing them in order to hit a particular goal. Like I have one right now. I have to uh, be in a particular shape by the start of September because I have uh, several upcoming video projects, a documentary, which is to be short. Yeah. So, yes, I do have a goal in mind and that will keep changing my splits. My nutrition is going to vary by the week. Lots and lots of changes, Sadis Khan. So, by the beginning of September, I think I should be where I need to be in order to get those uh, shoots done. So, I am working currently on my next upcoming projects, which obviously requires me to be at uh, the peak of my, my, uh, my shape. So I actually am working on myself right now in order to get ready for what's coming next. And I'll be sharing those results with everybody to see. Oh, that's good. Um, do you like, do you train to failure, meaning sets to failure? Or Absolutely. Do you do... Okay. Every single set. I do not recall narrowing down my sets to a particular amount of reps. It can go as high as 40. It can be as low as 15. Unless I am not done till failure on every single set, every single, I'm, I'm not talking about the last set of, a, of an exercise. Every single set of mine has to be till failure. That's how I've always trained. And that is what I believe brings about the dense look, the maturity in your muscle is when you train to failure. And Dorian Yates is a prime example of that. Well, no, because uh, I like to ask this question because someone like Jay Cutler, he never trained till failure. He used to do around, he, at one point of his life when he won the Olympia, he was doing 20 reps in a single set. And he wasn't doing it till failure, right? And then someone like Dorian Yates was just going 
balls deep every every single workout, right? And someone like Ronnie Coleman, who used to go up to 25, 30 reps per set. See, everybody yeah. had their own ways. Everybody had their own method. See, Aras, you need to realize and understand one thing in particular. The names you're mentioning, Jay Cutler, Ronnie, Dorian, Sean Ray, these, we are talking about a minuscule percentage yeah. Yeah. of people who were born with the most alpha and supreme genetics the human body can ever be. Have you ever looked and seen how Jay Cutler looked when he was 14 years yeah, old? Yeah, he was completely out of his mind. And how Ronnie Coleman looked when he was in his high school? Yeah. He, Ronnie Coleman had 24-inch biceps when he wasn't even competing on stage. He was a bouncer at an Olympia competition. We are talking about supreme genetics and that is something you cannot compete with and that is where people go wrong. You know, if a uh, someone like me with Asian genetics wants to, you know, one day, you know, decide to be Mr. Olympia. It doesn't work that way. I can become a cricketer. I can practice on being a batsman, but I cannot end up being Mr. Olympia because I do not have the genetics to be one. So Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler, these were childhood prodigies. You know, these guys were those who were, who were destined to be bodybuilding. They were destined for this. You look at their childhood pictures, you see how they looked when they were teenagers, even before they had touched the weights. They were huge, man. They were big. Yeah, they were big dudes. These guys are genetic freaks, you know, they, the genetics exactly. are the other side of bodybuilding. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to ask, uh, do you believe in rest days? Uh, you know, one rest day, two rest days, uh, how many rest days in between? Do you, like, and sometimes people take it in between, meaning and not completing the full body and then they take it in between. So. Absolutely. I, I do not believe in a particular number or a figure to narrow it down. But what I do believe in is listening to your body. So your body will tell you whether or not you need a rest day and how many do you need. It's your body and you communicating the whole time. So you just cannot narrow it down to, you know, I'm going to rest every Sunday or, you know, every Wednesday. It is something you need to act upon when you communicate with your body. So there is no fixed day for the rest day, but you do need them to answer your question. You cannot recover. You cannot grow. Yes, and until you have... So rest days are very important. At least once a week is highly recommended. Okay. Uh, you know, how much of a part do you play in your client's motivation? Well, the clients who usually come up to me and 90% of them are those who, you know, follow me or come across me through social media. Mm -hmm. And that's how they come and approach me because they say, you know, this is what we want to look like. This is, you know, this is the goal we have in mind to look more like you do. So if somebody comes up to you for, you know, for training and they want to look like you, I guess I do motivate them then, don't I? Hopefully. No, because, uh, you know, sometimes let's just say you're with a client, right? And things are not working out, meaning whatever you're giving them, right? Sometimes they cheat on their diet, right? Or they don't take it as strict as, do you keep working with them or do you tell them to like buy smart up? <laughs> See, I, I, you know, as a trainer, as a teacher, you have to be very patient. Nobody will follow a diet plan to the core right away you have to give them a reason to do that it is so easy to just hand over a diet plan and expect your client to follow it no it does not work that way you need to create an environment where the client sees it as an absolute necessity to follow that diet plan that's how a smart teacher should be working with you know right you just don't force it on them you know you show them now listen you had four meals yesterday before coming to me your performance was amazing and look, you turned up today with two meals and you can hardly do anything. You can't lift the weights and you're not at your best. So when you prove it to them, then that's their motivation right away. Then they will go back and they will be careful. A good teacher needs to create an atmosphere where the client sees clarity. So that's what I try to do. I try and make them see some clarity and make them realize that every step, every meal is important when it comes to that goal we have in mind. 
So yeah. that works usually. It works. I don't coerce them. I don't, uh, you know, I don't bother them. I don't force them. I make them understand why they need to follow it. That's what everybody should do. You need to make them realize. And then it never fails. They do the work. You know, I, I live in Canada, so I don't know much about Pakistan and how training works. How do you think Pakistan personal training is? Like, uh, do you think there's a lack of knowledge? Do you think there's too many people in the business? Do you think that there's a lot of misguidance in the business, like in Pakistan in general? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's relatively new in Pakistan. I would, you know, it's not something which has been around since the longest of times. I mean, I would give it, what, probably a decade, a decade at most. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the trainers here are still relatively new, but there are trainers who are doing a good job. There are trainers here that know what they're doing. And, you know, just like any other process which requires time in the next couple of years, there will be more. And uh, like any other field, you will see more names coming up. And as far as misguided trainers go, you know, they're everywhere in the world. You know, they're misguided doctors, teachers, lawyers, policemen. Um, how is Pakistan any different? It's the same everywhere. You have the good, you yeah. have the bad. It's the same. It's the same everywhere. Okay. Um, you know, every trainer has their own techniques or something. What are some methods that you use that are completely different from what other people would use or some, what are your peers would use? Meaning people around you, trainers, you know, that would be two. My, the, the one thing I try, I try and do differently is I emphasize a lot on the psychological aspect, as we discussed at the beginning of the show. There's so many people out there, Harris, who just ignore what the human mind is capable of. I have had a client, um, you know, a very high profile client who was on a heavy dosage of antidepressants. And when I tapered him off, I got a call from their doctor and it wasn't exactly a very polite phone call. You know, uh, he called me and he, you know, uh, he wasn't uh, exactly polite. And he told me, you know, this is my field. And why are you interrupting in it? You're a trainer, stick to your job. Why are you asking my client to cut down on his medication? Uh, your client cannot survive without that medication. He'll end up killing himself. And I still remember we managed to get him off his drugs in six months. And it's been two years as of today. That particular person in question never went back to taking antidepressants ever again. And this time I was the one who called the doctor and I reminded the doctor, you know, we had this phone call once and you said that your client cannot survive. Well, I got news for you. Your client's been off for a while now and he's doing absolutely fine. So what the doctor did not realize is the extreme power of will. That is the one thing I try and inculcate in my clients the most is the strength the power of your mind the psychological side harris is something which every athlete every client deserves to deserve you know to learn and discover about themselves so that is the one aspect i really work on the most i think that is something i think i do differently okay. so i want some information from you so let's just say an overweight client comes to you right uh, around 28 30 percent body fat comes to you and says, I want to, I want to get muscular, right? And he right. just comes and says, I want to get muscular. How do you help this person change? Well, if he's on 28 or 30% body fat, being muscular is the least of his concerns at this point in time. The first step is to bring his body fat down, <laughs> right? Contrary to the popular belief that you can, you know, um, go from 30% to being gripped, you know, in a couple of weeks. It just doesn't happen that way, Harris. You have to undergo a particular process. And in this process, you have to burn fat while simultaneously uh, develop and work on your muscle growth. So it is a process which we call lean bulking, in which you drop your body fat down and you start increasing your muscle mass. So it is possible. And as to how I would take about that client is, it's very simple. We set a time frame as a goal. Um, if it's about 28, 30% body fat and this 
particular trainer in question is to be myself, I would look at a time frame of at least 10 to 12 months, which I would be very sure to convey to the client before I take him or her on. And then we start working step by step. You do not immediately start off by, you know, putting your client on a very strict uh, caloric deficit diet. You start off very gently. You start easing them into the workouts. You start helping them to realize that this is fun. You know, this is not torture. This is something you can enjoy, you know. Come to the gym and look forward to that one hour with me as one of the best hours of your day because this is something we're doing for our own health. Gradually ease them into the workout, help them understand the theories behind exercises. It's what I do. Every particular exercise that we train or perform, I make it a point to convey to the client that, you know, this particular exercise is for this particular muscle, right? So from the basics, step by step, I work them up, work on their stamina, strength, and endurance. Then we start bringing in something like supersets. We start bringing the rest period down, the time between sets, the rest between sets starts going down. The heart rate starts going higher and higher with every progressive week. And then the diet aspect comes in. And in a few weeks and months, when the client starts seeing the change, you know, that's half your job done. That's half your job done. Then it's just following the plan. It's just, you know, making changes where necessary, manipulating carbohydrates, changing your workout splits. So a good time frame for this particular hypothetical client would be anywhere between 10, 10 to 12 uh, months. So, I mean, you know, are there anything? So for in the beginning, you're going to have to get him to completely tone down his body fat. So are you going to incorporate fasted cardio? Are you going to incorporate, um, you know, a low carb diet? Or are you even going to do any uh, uh, weight training with him in the beginning? See, it all depends on how the client is um, currently holding up. Like if this particular client in question has, you know, knee issues, if this particular client, you know, cannot run right away, he's overweight. I cannot have him jump onto a treadmill and start running from day one, can I? So we will need to start off with certain exercises, which will ultimately make him strong enough to reach a different exercise. It's called a means to an end. For people who cannot do a squat because they have a, you know, injured knee and injured Achilles tendon, you know, something like a ligament rupture. So we have to treat every case individually harder. So there's no one size or one plan fits all. So in order for me to ease the client into the training, we have to start with the basics. Ease the client into workout. Your goal is to make the client stick to it and not run away. So fasted cardio is not advisable for someone who just joined you as a client and you know is at a 30% body fat. You know, that is something that would be very unfair of you as a trainer to you know have your client do. It is not something you would want to do right away. So these things, these techniques come after. Just uh, come in right away. Okay. Okay. So you also did, I was watching uh, Hamza Ali Abbasi. So how long did he work with you for? Hamza Bhai has been working with me on and off. We first started training for Mola. And then I also helped him achieve his pilot look for another film called Parvaz Hai Junoon. So for so that, he's that- so skinny. He got skinny for that one. Yeah. And uh, we had already shot the scene for Mola Jat before the, the announcement dates came in, the shooting dates came in for uh, Parvaz Hai Junoon. So I had to take him from, I think, 90 or 95 kilograms to 70 in maybe four or five months. Wow. So both of those films will show a different physique. If you watch those films in Mola Jart, he is this huge menacing character playing the, you know, the, the arch enemy of uh, Nur Mola. And in Parvaz Hai Junoon, he is back to his uh, torn, skinny, um, you know, pilot look. So I worked with him on both of those projects and I think he did a fantastic job. It was like one extreme end of the 
the paradigm from another it was it was highly commendable the the goals that we were achieve we were able to achieve in such a short amount of time yeah no because you know when i saw the trailer i think you know fawad khan he is an excellent actor but i was very very fond of hamza ali basi because the way he looked his voice right it, it's so heavy first of all but the way he looked with the long hair i think he he's giving very justice a lot of justice to that character so i yeah with him but i i couldn't see his physique i he, he, there was not that much but um who else have you worked with in pakistan any uh celebrities see since the beginning of this podcast you have been very focused on uh, the celebrity transformation see are is all of those celebrities to me were not celebrities they're just like any other client mm-hmm. right so in order to answer your question i have worked with imran abbas i have worked with bilal ashraf i've worked with uh, imran abbas i've worked with ali rehman i've worked with ali moin nawazesh um i've i've worked with almost all of them you know that's good mashallah but uh, uh, once they were just regular clients to me i mean i didn't you know follow something special for them because they happen to be celebrities at the end of the day i'm just a guy who has to do a job yeah so it doesn't really matter to me if the client i'm training is a celebrity or not they would still re-rack their own weights i would make sure they re-rack their own weights put their dumbbells back so they didn't ever ask or demand any extra treatment and that's why i have a lot of respect for them they did what was supposed to be done so what does the future hold for mr hasan mahmood do you have some future endeavors coming up so you said documentary and a lot of these other things yes uh, that's in september we have these uh, we have this documentary coming up it's a project uh someone i know has been working on since a long time now and we are starting on it in september inshallah if everything goes well inshallah and um, as to future endeavors they keep coming up here and there it's not something i plan way ahead of time unless i have to like this documentary has a date you know which has been finalized so i know for a fact that this has to happen and i need to be ready and uh, things just happen by like look at this podcast one fine day i get a message and here we are it just happens yeah, exactly yeah life is supposed to be like that it's i'm not a i don't plan too much in advance i take things as they are because you know coming from someone who you know unfortunately buried uh, two of his children lost two of his children you know i'm the last person on earth who would believe in long term planning so whatever comes along for now it's my clients their well being their happiness their health the health of my friends my family my own self that's the immediate goal for now and to keep okay. doing what i do and help make people's lives better that's the most satisfying part of what i do and i take a lot of pride in that that's good that's good so you know do you have anything any questions for me uh <laughs> yeah. my questions are all out when when are you coming to visit us in pakistan inshallah i will come if, um, us in pakistan we, i mean canada you are coming to pakistan coming back to canada it's very hard it's just they've locked us down completely we're the only country that's right now currently in lockdown in the world so traveling and everything is come very hard i was in pakistan i came this year i wasn't i was there in february uh, but you know coming back is very hard so yeah you know, hard it's like- 14 hour flight or something it's 14 hour flight but then even after that you have to quarantine in a hotel then you have to quarantine at home for 14 days right it's Plus, be okay these times are not here to stay forever yeah, but yeah, when inshallah, it, inshallah. When, when this time passes by you know i would love to have you over as a guest sit down together you know definitely you know, definitely i would love to have a workout with you absolutely That's i would love to, absolutely you're more than welcome you're more than welcome thank you thank you um so uh you know uh uh what else are you uh doing nowadays are you just training or do you do any other work too on the side see i work 14 hours a day with my clientele so that doesn't really leave me with anything much else does it it's what i do that's my it's my entire career it's not something i do as a side business this is what i am this is what i do for a living and as a passion chalo that was for me it's my and, it's my uh, client 
it's my clients, the ones I train. It's my international clientele across 36, 37 countries now, alhamdulillah. Um, it is, you know, me working with different projects. So everything I do is, you know, it comes down to the same thing, which is health and fitness. That's what I am, a fitness entrepreneur, I guess. How much of a lockdown did you guys have down there? Well, uh, a lot, but uh, doesn't mean we followed it to the way did it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about Pakistan. It's how casual we are. And I love that. No, I love that too. Don't worry. I love that too. No, over <laughs> here, our gyms closed, right? March 2020. They are still closed by law, but everybody's, uh, you know, yeah. going on with it. And I like that, you know, <laughs> like I said, I love how casual we are. We are still operating. No, yeah, I think, I feel like in this pandemic, a lot of mental health cases and all these things. I think is in a... this, like, and after the pandemic, the most important institution is going to be the gymnasiums. Yes, definitely. Definitely. If you want your, the people to regain their sanity, I think it's very important that gyms, now be respected the most once this whole situation ends up. And I think that's a good thing. At times, you need a kick to the gut to realize how important something is, don't we? Jalo, that was all for me. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Mr. Hassan. Bhai. You know, I, Not uh, problem, it's my pleasure. And, you know, I would, I would say this is one of the best uh, shows I've done in a long, long time. These questions you came up with, were so interesting, so engaging. So I personally enjoyed this probably more than you did. I, I think this is this has to be one of the better interviews, shows I've done in a long time. Thank you so much. So, Thank you. So, you know, hats off to you. Hats off for to your research. You know, the way you came up with the questions prepared, showed you had a plan. I enjoyed this, Haris. I really did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do this again some other time. Inshallah.